What I want to talk about today is the accumulation of this small series that we've had. The, the, the idea behind this series, it's called Building a Life Worth Living. And I'm just, I'm just really, really concerned about so many Christians who feel like somehow, uh, you know, they, they're, they're Christian, they, they follow the Lord, but somehow they're just going to end up being sort of battered and bruised by everything that life throws at them. And they've just got to sort of hold on, and, and there's nothing that they can really do except expect for the best and hope for God to do some kind of miracle. Listen, in life you will face difficulties. In life, you will face problems. In life, you will face disappointment. That's clearly true. The Bible says, Jesus told his disciples, in this life, you will have troubles. In this world, you will have troubles. He said, but don't be afraid because I've overcome the world. And what this series, my point in this series is to tell each and every one of you, you should not be just passively letting life happen to you. You should be building your own life. You should be building your own home. You should be building the circumstances of your life because God allows you to build a life that's worth living. Two weeks ago when we started this series, we talked about the passage of Scripture that Jesus used, the illustration of building your house on a rock. And he said to build your house on a rock means to have a stable foundation. And the foundation that all of us have is the foundation of our relationship with the Lord. The most important thing for each and every one of you to know is the absolute most important thing in your life must be the relationship that you have. You must, pers- you must put God first in absolutely area, every area of your life. And if you do that, you build a foundation that the Word of God says can withstand whatever might happen to you. On top of that, last week we talked about the other kinds of relationships that we have. If our relationship with God the Father is the most important relationship in our life, what about the other relationships? And, and for most of us, the most critical relationships are actually our spouse, our, our, our children, our parents, and other family members that we have. How do we prioritize those things? So last week, we talked about what does the Bible say about putting those things in priority? Remember, whenever we talk about priorities, the very first priority is what? Our relationship with God. That has to come first. In every other relationship that we have, the guideline is our relationship with God. And then we saw that our next responsibility is our relationship with our spouse. And then our relationship with our children. And then our relationship with our parents. And then finally our relationship with the other members of our family. Now in a multicultural church like we are, we have people from all kinds of backgrounds and traditions. And it's important for us to clarify these things. Because some of us grew up in a, in, a, in a society or in a culture or in a, in a, in a uh, guideline that said, for instance, that you put your relationship with your parents over your relationship with your spouse. Or you put your relationship with your children over your relationship with your, with your spouse. Or you put your relationship with your parents over your children and all these different kinds of things. And it's important that we're not teaching an attitude of hostility. But we're saying that if you put your relationships in the right order, then your life is good. you're going to build a cohesive life that will work well according to God's plans, no matter what problems you have, that things will be able to hold together. Now, our theme for today is this. What else? What else is there in our lives? What, how do we deal with the rest of our things of our lives? Once we have our relationship with God as our first priority, once we sort out the main personal relationships of our lives and bring those things into, into uh, uh, alignment with what God wants, what about everything else? Well, for most of us, the everything else is quite simple. The everything else is our professional life, our professional world. The everything else is our ministry world. And the everything else is our social world, our our world in society. Let me define these really quickly so you understand. First of all, when I talk about our professional life, I'm talking about our career. And let me say very clearly, uh, I consider a a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad, for that matter, as also being a career. A person who dedicates their life to providing an atmosphere in their home and, and training in their children and all those things, that's a wonderful thing. And I consider that part of that whole picture. And then I want you to understand that there's a big difference between your ministry and your relationship with God. Now, this is something that I feel is really important, and sometimes we forget these things. A lot of people think that your relationship with God is your ministry. So like if you're going to to a life group, you have a good relationship with God. If you're not going to a life group, you have a bad relationship with God. That's not what it's all about. Your relationship with God is, 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 is interacting with Him, is speaking to Him, is reading His Word, is praying, and is living your Bible according to the standards that He sets. 
Your ministry is an allocation of time to fulfill certain kinds of things. And I'll talk more about that later. And then finally, it's your role in society. You all have roles in society. You're members of larger families. You're members of organizations. You're members of, uh, 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 you know, a reunion group. You all went to the same school together. Uh, you're members of a political party. You're members of a union. You, you have all those kinds of other relationships. And these things are, are pretty much the whole sum of our lives. These, everything else, how do we deal with these? I want you to all stand to your feet. And we're going to read a passage of Scripture that will give us the guidelines as to how we look at all of these things and the guidelines for our behavior in our life that will lead us in all of these things. And then finally, for the closing, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the relationship between work and ministry and social needs and society and all those kinds of things. But let's read together. This is from Colossians chapter 3. Let's read, read with enthusiasm. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Let's pray together and ask the Lord to speak to us. Father, it's our desire to build lives that last, to build lives of consequence, to build lives that will have an eternal impact, to build lives that will be pleasing to you, to build lives that will be a blessing to our families, to build families and homes that, so that we can see our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren following you, to build lives and homes that no matter what storm comes, we might suffer loss. We might be discouraged, but we know that our faith in you will bring us through. Building lives that really matter. This is our desire, Lord. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us in these words that we're going to be listening to and following. I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to become alive in our own hearts and to apply these things into our own lives. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats again. The goal for us is to understand this, that in doing work, and in doing everything else that we do, including work, that we need to do all these things, we need to do our life in a way that brings glory to God. In everything that we do, we need to be living our life in such a way that brings glory to God. Now, the biggest danger I see in this is that we learn to separate our work lives, our professional lives, from our spiritual lives. In other words, when I, when I, I, I kind of heard the concept, but I'd never heard it so clearly expressed. When I first came to Indonesia, uh, somebody said to me, well, Pastor Dave, you know, this is the church and this is the world, and there's no connection between the two. We do this in the church, we do this in the world, and it doesn't, you know, these are two like separate lies. And the idea behind that is like on Sunday, we're all spiritual, except for the people who go on Saturday, then they're spiritual on Saturday. And, and then on Monday to Friday, we're in our work world, and that's completely different. And the person we are on Sunday has no influence on the person we are Monday to Friday. And then sometimes on Saturday, we're a completely other different person too. That's a terrible idea. It's completely a wrong idea. We need to understand that what God has and desires for us is to be for us to be an integrated person. And in this whole area, not just in our spiritual life, not just in a relationship with our family, but in our whole area of our life, we're doing everything in a way that's pleasing to him and in a way that brings glory to God. Now, the question is, how do we do this? Well, this passage that we read says some things pretty starkly, and it really speaks boldly to this. First of all, it says, let the peace of God reign in your hearts. Let the peace of God reign in your hearts. Now, what does that mean? The peace of God reigning in our hearts is not an issue of blind ignorance. It's not an issue of, of, of just kind of saying, well, everything will be okay if we, you know, if, we don't, if we don't worry about it. The peace of God is where we look around us and we see, instead of seeing the challenges and seeing the threats and seeing the possibilities and being overwhelmed by them, instead we understand that in Christ we can do anything and through Christ we can overcome anything. So we're at peace in our lives not because we don't know there are problems. There are problems in this world. 
People, people betray you. Accidents happen. You get sick. You, you fail at something that you're doing. You plan the very best you can and your plans fall apart. Those things are all true. I, I would be a marvelously popular pastor if I could get up here and convince you, if you follow Jesus, you'll never have any problems. But it's an absurd lie. Anybody who reads the Bible knows it's not true. Some of the people who had the greatest struggles were the ones that were the, 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 the most faithful to God. But what we see in them is that they let the peace of God rule in their heart. They knew that no matter what came, they knew that God would be with them in and through everything. And they could not be overcome. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Is your heart troubled today? You know, uh, this isn't, I mean, this is in my notes, but what I'm going to tell you right now is not in my notes. I just have a really strong feeling right now that there are some people right here, right in this, in, this, in this moment, in this place, whose hearts are not at peace at all. I'm just going to ask you all to bow your heads. I believe there are some people here today, and your heart is really troubled, really, really troubled. And I believe that the Lord wants you to hold on to this part of the sermon. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. I just believe that God is speaking to you and saying, don't be troubled. Your problem may not go away and disappear immediately. But in Jesus and through Jesus, you can have victory over those things. Now what I want to do right now, I want to pray for you. I'm just going to ask, nobody's looking around, everybody just close your eyes. If there are some people here today whose hearts are really troubled, let me pray for you. Let me pray for you as your pastor. Very quietly, just, just quietly stand to your feet. Your heart, you're here today and your heart is troubled. Anyone? Anyone else? Your heart is troubled. I want to pray for you. This is not between other people. This, you don't have to explain anything to anybody, but your heart is troubled. Father, I just lift up to you, Lord, these people. As this, as this message from your word that we read was expressed, the Holy Spirit saw their heart and spoke to me. And you gave me a word to say to them, Lord, that they need to not let their heart be troubled. They need to put their trust in you. Right now, I pray in Jesus' name that through your Holy Spirit that you would remind them of your great faithfulness Though no matter what they face, no matter what may be coming along the way, they can put their trust in you. And you will never fail them. You will never leave them. And sometimes, Father, you will remove the obstacle in a miraculous way. But other times, Father, you will stay with them. And instead of being overwhelmed, they will be victorious in everything they face. Be with them, Father. Let your Holy Spirit speak to them. Okay, Those of you who stood can take your seats again. Let the peace of God reign in your heart. God is more than enough for anything that you might face. Now let's move on. It says be thankful. Be thankful. One of the things I want to encourage you to do is it's not always easy to be thankful. Sometimes in some circumstances you can find very little to be thankful about. Now later on in July before we leave, I think it's going to be July 18 and 19, I'm planning on doing a live Q&A. And, uh, and, and one of the things, if you have some questions about, you know, Pastor Dave, are we supposed to be thankful about bad things that happen too? I'll address that situation. But, but I really appreciate Pastor Misha's new song that we, we sang today, that he, he wrote that song. I think today's the first one. Every day in every way, I'm going to be thankful because no matter what happens to you, you can find things to be thankful for. So I don't know how to be thankful for this problem. Well, if you can't find a way to be thankful for the problem, there are other things that you can be thankful for. And you should be thankful in all of these things. Then it goes on to say, let the message of Christ live in us. Live the good news. What's the message of Christ? That God loved us so much that he sent his son into the world. And because his son came into the world, we could be reconciled to God the Father. And we need to live our lives in the truth of that. How does that happen? How does it impact your life and change your life if you believe, for instance, that God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you? How does it impact your life if you know that no matter what happens in this world, you're going to spend eternity with God together in heaven, that God is going to fix all of these problems, he's going to bring a new heaven and a new earth, and we're victorious in him? How does that affect the way you live? Live that way. 
Live with that perspective. How does it affect your perspective to understand that everyone who's, uh, who's distant from God, their life will be dramatically changed and they're turned over and they'll be set free if they can meet Jesus and know who Jesus is? Live the gospel. Live the message of Christ in everything that you do. And then interestingly enough, it says admonish one another and encourage one another. And it lists, you know, songs and hymns and all these kinds of things. My suggestion, we think about two things. Number one, usually when we think about singing, we think about that we're singing and worshiping God. And that's good. That's wonderful. But isn't it interesting that Paul in this passage says that when we're together with others, our singing should be an encouragement for other people? Did you know that? What that means is if you have a voice like me, that's why I sit in the front row for the first part of the worship service, and then I move over there, because my voice won't encourage anybody. Yeah, singing is not my gift. But if you have the gift and you, you can sing, you know, you can sing and know that you're not only worshiping God, but you're encouraging one another. Now, my other suggestion is that you don't necessarily put that into practice in the office. Yeah, so you don't go to your office and go up to somebody's desk and say, you know, I wasn't even going to try and sing. <laughs> Admonish and encourage one another. Maybe not necessarily through songs like it says, though it clearly says that. But in the words that you say, give an encouraging word. I, I, have, some, I have some people that I study the Bible with, a, a group of guys that I study with the Bible with once a, mo- once a week in the morning. And, and getting ready for church today, I got message after message after message from these guys. God bless you, have a good Sunday. God bless you, have a good Sunday. God bless you, have a good Sunday. And it was so encouraging to me, except for one thing. I was thinking, what about last night? Because <laughs> I'm here on Saturday night too, you know, my, much my whole weekend. Encourage one another by the things you say and, and, and lift one another up in those ways. And it goes on to say this. Not only admonish one another and encourage one another, it says that we need to, re- or I, I'm saying that we need to remember that our life has two aspects. Our life, living our life for God has two aspects, and those two aspects are word and deed. And what we're being called to do is to let the things that we say measure up to the gospel and let the things that we do measure up to the gospel. Now, this is the formula for how we should live our lives. The goal of living our lives in this way is that everything that I do in my life should be done in such a way that it brings glory to God. Everything I do in my professional career should be done in such a way that it brings glory to God. Everything I do within my ministry aspects should be done in such a way that it brings glory to God. Everything I do within my social framework, whether I'm a member of a chamber of commerce or whether I'm a member of a, 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 of a professional association or whether I'm a member of, a, of, a, of, of an alumni of a university or something like that, all of those things need to bring glory to God. And we need to integrate our lives so that we can build a life worth living where we don't have this sector over here and this sector over here and this sector over here. We bring it all together. Now, let me say a few things real quickly about how we do these things in terms of priorities. Because I think it was really, really important yet last week that we learned the, the priorities in our close relationships. Spouse, children, parents, and family. And there are some priority issues here as well, and I want you to clearly understand them. First of all, when we talk about our profession, when we talk about our work, when we talk about the way that we earn our living or the way that we provide for our families and things, it's really hard to find a lot of stuff in Scripture that talks explicitly about that. Because 2,000 years ago when the, when the New Testament was being written, people didn't have jobs per se. Now, just to give you an example, uh, if I was a, a, a silversmith, if I worked making things out of silver, plates and jewelry and things like that, I didn't have employees that I hired. I had either apprentices who learned the trade from me, and as soon as they were good enough, they would leave and set up their own business and probably try and steal my customers, or I would have slaves, and and I didn't pay them. I, I just had to feed them enough to keep them working. So our environment today is a little bit different, but there were relationships, and there are things in the Bible that talks about those relationships, and I think those things are, are worth us understanding. So take a look at what it says in Scripture. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, it says this, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does whether he is slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. 
Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and your master is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Now, what can we take out of that? What can we learn from that passage? Because, uh, and by the way, if you wonder, well, Pastor Dave, how come the Bible doesn't tell us to stop slavery? Uh, ask me that question when it comes time for question and answer time. I know a lot of you aren't really interested in sort of theological, economic, political history, and I don't want to go into that too much. But if it's a question, then I'll, then I'll attack it at that time. But, but this is the closest thing that we can find that tells us in our professional lives how we're supposed to behave. What attitude are we supposed to have? And you might say, well, Pastor Dave, if you talk about a slave, you, you really are describing my boss really well, or, you know, it may be something like that. But the keys that are in here are really, really important. The two issues that it addresses here that, that, that we need to bring into our lives are, number one, the issue of wholeheartedly. In other words, when we are a follower of Jesus Christ in our professional realm, we are supposed to embrace our work wholeheartedly. And it reminds us that everything that we do is not necessarily done for the glory of whatever company you happen to work for. Your life does not belong to Schlumberger or whoever it is you you, you work for. It belongs to God. And the way you work is a reflection of who you actually belong to. And you're not supposed to work in such a way as just enough to get by, but you're supposed to wholeheartedly do the very best that you can. And the other issue that it talks about there is fairness. And it reminds us, and this is a good reminder for all of us, because if, we, if we're in a professional field, and even if we're not in a professional field, we not only have usually people who are over us and telling us what to do, but we also have people underneath us that we can talk to. And it reminds us that we are supposed to be fair in everything that we do. Do the people who work for you describe you as fair? That's what you're supposed to be because you're reminded that God sees everything that we do and ultimately He is our master in all of these things. What do your employees say about you? Does the way you conduct your professional life reflect the fact that Jesus is Lord? What I want is that for wherever you work in whatever position, if you're a director of a company, if you're a middle-level management in a company, if you're an employee in a company, I want the people around you to look at you and I want them to say, we need to have more people like this person because they're, good, they're a good worker, they're honest in their job, they're wor- they, they work well with other people, and they're faithful. And that's what we want to see in our, in our life, in our, in our professional career. We want to see all these things happening. Now, the next question is, what about ministry? And this is, the, the, this is the area that really concerns me because a lot of people in the world, to see, uh, world see their professional life and their ministry life as being in opposition. Let me say that if you have a job, your first ministry is your job. I mean, not first before your family, but your ministry is your job. In fact, that's why I'm putting them in order and saying that I believe that if you're a good Christian, you'll live your life in such a way that you will prioritize your professional life over your ministry life. Can I hear people go, (gasps) because that's not usually what you hear. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Your ministry is not your relationship with God. Your relationship with God, it comes absolutely first. But so many times people try and create a conflict and a conflict develops between ministry and profession. Let me try and illustrate it this way. Suppose that you feel like God wants you to go to the orphanage camp, and you're thinking, okay, uh, July 10, 11, and 12. But then supposedly you think, well, I don't think my boss is going to actually give me three days off to go do ministry in the orphanage camp. But since it's ministry, you sign up, get ready to go be a volunteer, and late on the night, you call your boss and say, <coughs> I'm not feeling well. I have to take three days off. <coughs> now, obviously, there are a lot of problems there, right? Number one, you're a liar, okay? So you're impacting your relationship with God. You're not allowed to do anything. Your relationship with God absolutely has to come first. But, but you're also being not, not dependable. What kind of testimony are you giving? And in fact, your, your co-workers who depend on you, you're cheating them. I mean, you're failing at so many different levels. 
Now, don't misunderstand me. We need people who are going to go to the orphanage camp, but we don't need people who are going to go to the orphanage camp and cheat their boss to be there. And this is a problem that we, 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 we see come up. I've, I've seen this my whole life in ministry, uh, you know, as it relates to the, this, this, this people creating this conflict between these different kinds of things. One of, my, one of my favorite stories when I was pastoring in the Philippines, there was this young teenage girl in the church, and she was always saying, please pray for me because my parents are persecuting me, and they won't let me go to church anymore. Please pray for me. And she was always making this prayer request. And I was thinking, you know, we could talk to the parents, and we could maybe help this out, Yeah. So with some other people, we contacted the parents and talked to the parents, and we said, you know, now we understand that you don't want your daughter to come to church anymore. And they said, no, 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 no. We don't mind if she goes to church. She said, the problem was that she was going to the team service, teen service at 5 o'clock, and she wasn't getting home till like 11 or 11.30 at night. She goes to the teen service, and she's there from 5 to 7, and then she goes over here with this group of people, and she goes over here with this group of people, and she does this, and she hangs out here, she does this. And then late at night, her parents were, they didn't want her traveling alone on public transportation late at night. And as good parents, they shouldn't have wanted that. But instead, she was taking her attitude towards her parents, and she was turning it into a, it's my ministry to be there, I have to be there. And she was creating this false conflict. This conflict should not exist. It's something that needs to be managed. I'm, I'm all in favor of ministry. We, we need more people to, to do everything. We, we need more people to be life group leaders. We need more people uh, to, to help out with the kids' ministry. We need more people to help out with the teens' ministry. We need more people in all these things. But you cannot prioritize those things over your family and, and over other situations and anything like that. You cannot this, create this idea where your ministry is more important than things. Your relationship with God is first. Your ministry has to fit in with all the other areas of your life. Uh, on the way in this morning, uh, Pastor Dave Stanislaus, we were talking about this, this idea, and, and he told a great story. I, I hope I do it justice. I'm going to try and repeat your story. Uh, Pastor David took a class in, in uh, graduate school uh, that was called Theology of Work, and they were listening to a story, and then the story was about a young man who was telling his parents that he didn't have time to help them out, kind of in their old age, because he was called into the ministry, and he had to do this ministry. And the father told the son, and he said, you know, son, when you were a young child, when you were a young baby, when you were three or four months old, and you were sick at night, and your mother would stay up all night helping you and taking care of you and, and meeting your needs, that was your mother's ministry. And it's really sad that you can't see that now it's just as much a ministry for you to take care of your parents also. Wow, that was great. Was it close enough? Told the story the right way. Folks, ministry is a way that we integrate opportunities that God gives us to be involved in things. Please don't anybody go out and say, Pastor Dave said we don't have to do any ministry. I want you all to do ministry. The, the scripture that we quote, it says in 1 Timothy, anyone who desires to serve as an overseer desires to do a good thing. And we want people to desire to be involved in ministry. But don't allow yourself to separate your life into the spiritual portion and the non-spiritual portion. And don't allow it to create a conflict between those things. Everything that we do should be pleasing to God. The final area that we talk about is the area of society. And God calls us really clearly in a number of different passages. The most maybe important one is in Matthew chapter 5 where he says we should, live a light that shine, we should live a life that shines like a light in the darkness. And the key in all three of these areas, in our professional sphere, in our works of ministry sphere, and in our roles in society and everything else like that, the key in all these things is to, is to do everything that we do in such a way that it brings glory to God. And to integrate our entire life in this manner and fashion. So that as sons and daughters of the living God, we live a life that's pleasing to him. And whether it's the office that we work out of, or the ministry that we volunteer for, or the political party that we're a member of, our families are in order with God's help, and our lives are committed to him. And then in every sphere of society that we impact we do all of those things for the glory of God and his kingdoms built up together. Don't let yourself go through life letting things move you and push you around. Build a life that's worth living. Put your faith in God. Strengthen your relationship with him. 
and place things in alignment. There is no promise that you won't have trouble. There is no promise that you won't have difficulty. There is no promise that you won't be impacted by things other people do. But the promise is that when those troubles come, none of them will overcome you. And you can build a life worth living.